Hey friends out there in YouTube land, Rob here. Today I wanna to talk to you about an audio workflow, Unity Gain, what that means, how to set all of your audio devices in your signal chain to work properly, specifically in a live streaming environment with a Yolo Live product like Yolo Box Pro, in this case, Yolo Box Ultra. However, the things that I'm talking about here today will transpose onto any other type of audio project that you may be working on. If you've ever found yourself on location or even working on your own passion project, frustrated because the audio is not working properly, this is a great video to get you started. It's not the only way, but if you have zero experience, come along with me today. As we go for it right here, I wanna kinda of set up what you're looking at. Number one, I'm gonna let you know I'm recording into my camera here using a wireless Hollyland Lark Max microphone. I love these microphones, I think they work great. This is the type of microphone and receiver transmitter that even has a little clip that will magnetically attach to your clothing with a little clip and stuff like that. It doesn't work on t-shirts, so I have to put on this jacket in order for it to be sturdy enough to hold it. This isn't really the type of environment that I would like to use this particular audio. It's just the easiest type of audio for me to use right here in studio. Sure, I could add something else like a boom mic above and everything else like that, but this is a multi-use space for me, so I set it up and take it down quite a bit throughout the day and the week. And this space right here, this is just easier. So when we start thinking about audio, we've got our capture and our input. This would be on our capture side and input side. And this choice would be the first choice in your series of choices that dictates how your audio is going to run just as easily as how it's captured from input to output on the screen. When we talk about output, we actually talk about the streaming destination or the destination such as a deliverable video. That output could be either in whatever file type you like, but it could be live or processed after the fact, like post-production. In the event of a live setting, all of your audio choices are going to be that much more important because if you have poor audio input in the first place during a live setting, you're gonna have poor audio export, which means your viewers are less likely to watch what it is you're talking about. Audio is half of video. If you have poor audio, they're just not gonna stick around. So if you notice that your view rates are low on something that you think should be relatively high, then you, one of the reasons could be terrible audio. Audio isn't only processed on the live side as it exports. It's also processed on the live side at the host called the Content Delivery Network, the CDN. This will be Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, things like that. YouTube will automatically apply normalization to your audio. So if you don't understand what YouTube's normalization guide is and their audio guide is, then whatever you do here, if it doesn't match up properly after it's streamed to YouTube, it won't sound right. The same goes with uh, Facebook or other platforms. So when we first notice our choice after choosing what microphone to use is to recognize what delivery destination we're going to use. For a live stream, that's your content delivery network. If you're doing some post-production, that's you later. Generally, when you do it later in post-production, you will have a harder time fixing your own issues, but no one will know about them as long as you uh, record a safety track. There's a lot more leeway in getting a good signal that you can use in post-production to clear up any audio. You can really do quite a bit. But when we're talking about live, you are cut out of the post-production workflow. And so getting it right in the first place is very important. So we've talked about the beginning choice, recognizing the ending choice, the beginning, the acquisition, the destination. What about happens in the middle? What about all that? Well, those two end stops that I designated, the input and the output, right? In between those are parts of our signal chain, the beginning part of our signal chain and the end part of our signal chain. And if you wanted to get really technical, the end part of the signal chain could be the user's device where they're turning the volume up or down on their own. If you've got content that goes from very quiet to very loud and the user specifically on mobile is constantly turning the volume up and down, you have quite a bit of dynamic range. You could use a tool like a compressor in order to compress the signal so the user has less uh, to work with as far as turning the volume up or down so that it's more uniform. However, sometimes that doesn't work well. Music is an instance where you want a lot of dynamic range. A scary movie is an instance where you want a lot of dynamic range. A college professor's uh, lecture is not a place where you want a lot of dynamic range. You want that voice in a specific spot. Where you first 
get your opportunity to correct that is by setting your levels properly from your microphone through the input into the original capture device to the hub, what's going to process it, in this case, Yolo Box Ultra for live streaming, and then out to your source, your content delivery network. So I want to invite you on what to do here. We've got a camcorder, which is turned on. I've got the shutter closed just so that it will, you know, be closed and you can see the words on here. And I recognize that you won't see these as well as I can see them. That's okay. You should be able to understand by me talking you through it and just seeing this. I'm not gonna be doing a lot of zooming in here. And let me address that real quick. I wanna look at you straightly. Look me right in the eyes right here. If you have to have a picture painted for you on every step of your journey, you are not ready to charge money for what you do yet. You don't know enough, right? So if you can watch this and follow along with it, you're good. If you have a hard time watching this and understanding what I'm saying, you need more practice. That's just as simple as it is. Everyone doesn't get a trophy. Your clients are going to hire you based on your work production and quality, and they're going to sue you based on what you screw up. So I'm giving you a big warning. If I can't just talk this through you and you see it from this and you need detail zoom in, then you need a coaching session with me. Give me an email. You know what to do. RobertHamPhotography.com will set up a coaching, a coaching session and I will help you. Let's continue. As we're looking right here, the camcorder actually has a couple of choices for microphones. If you didn't know that, uh, it does, just like your camera. Your camera generally doesn't have an input, an XLR input for an external microphone. It generally has an input for internal microphones, just like a camcorder. And you can also plug in external microphones through the use of the mic jack on your camera. On a camcorder, you usually get something called XLR. These are a professional standard grade input, means that lots of different microphones work with them, but you can also use a mic jack just like you would on your camera. It doesn't make any difference how the audio gets into your camera. Whatever source you wanna use, there are options to use it. Now, what we like to do when we're recording with a, a camera or camcorder specifically to a wedding or any kind of event, I like to do split left channel, right channel, separate recordings. That's because the camera is not just capturing the video as a record, it's also capturing audio as a record. So you could very easily split the audio into a left channel and a right channel with two separate microphones. Or you could split the audio with a left channel and one microphone and a right channel with the same microphone just recorded at different volumes to allow you to have a safety track in case something gets really, really loud or something goes very, very quiet that you can blend in post-production. These things will not help you during live production, but here's a pro tip and use it wisely. A, B, R. My team always A, B, R. Always be recording. Memory cards are cheap, storage space is cheap. Your liability is high. Push the record button and don't look back. In fact, my team is instructed when we get on site and click go, as soon as the camera's set up, we click record and it rolls the entire time. Yes, it creates a lot of additional footage, but it's audio as well as video from every camera that we're using, generally four, that allows us to go back and splice whatever we need in post-production. Even a live stream should have your uh, camera recording internally because it will protect you in the event that the live stream goes down. This is something we would talk about in a coaching, but let me ask you a real quick question. You're doing a wedding, you're doing a conference, you're doing a sports event for uh, a, a local school. The live stream goes down. You're not recording internally. Who pays for that? There's obviously a clause in your contract, right, that talks about acts of God, loss of connection. How do you go about protecting yourself when those things happen? I'm gonna here to tell you right now, having a backup recording that you can provide in the event the stream goes down because you record it internally is free insurance to protect you in those situations. If you don't do it, you shouldn't be in the business. It's that simple. Push, record, A, B, R. As we continue talking about this, the source in this case is this shotgun microphone. However, the source could be the internal stereo left and right microphone. On a camcorder, just like in your software on your camera, you have the opportunity to choose different ways to control the type of uh, signal that you're getting. Here we're gonna look at that. And I recognize you can't see it as well, I just wanted to give you a little extra, extra light. We've got a couple things right here. 
we've got our choice from our internal microphones, and then we've got a plug-in mic, and then we've got phantom power. Okay, phantom power is for external microphones that don't run on a battery that require power. The camcorder or your camera or your cinema camera can provide pa power to those devices that require phantom power. But let's go ahead and put everything up top at the front. This is my left input microphone and right input microphone. Right now, if noise, if sound was being recorded or sent to Yolo Box from the camcorder, we would see it represented in this bar up here. Well, this bar is grayed out right now. It's green, yellow, and red. Segmented. You don't see it. That's because the camcorder is also not receiving sound. I know you can't see this very well, but down here at the bottom, there's a spot for levels. It's just a little white segmented LCD display that shows when you have some kind of audio signal coming through. It's not lit up right now when I'm talking because it's not on, okay? How do we turn it on? Well, the first thing we do is we would check and see which device are we using. In this case, we look up here and we see these are the internal microphones left and right. The second thing we would do is we'd look and see how much actual gain, how much volume, how high have we turned up the sensitivity on the in and out microphones. In this case, they're down to zero. We can see that because the wheels are turned all the way to the left. If I simply turn up right here and turn up right here, we will now begin to see a little bit of signal coming through down here. But we don't see any signal coming through up there. We're going to get to that in just a moment. Right now, I know that I'm being picked up with my internal microphones, but instead I want to use my external microphone. I could want to use this for many reasons. The first one is for splitting. In a situation like this, I could have a shotgun microphone on the camera and I could have a lavalier microphone in someone's, or not a lavalier, but a handheld microphone or a lavalier, I suppose, in someone's hand and they could be out and about doing something connected wirelessly. So they could get local sound to wherever they are and I would get ambient sound here. This is a way that splitting, like we talked about earlier, would be very helpful in your production. However, in this case, I want to do the same channel to left and right and I want it to be this internal microphone, well, this external microphone. I need to look at my settings to choose where am I, okay? And right now, if I looked at my switches, it would say, hey, we're on the internal left and internal right microphones. So what I need to do is be on my mic position. So I click down one click. And when I click down one click, you notice that all of my levels down here represented on the screen in the camcorder went away. That mic position is for a, an external microphone that, is, that has its own uh, power or for a microphone plugged into the mic jack on the camcorder. There's something else that we want to do. We want to make sure that we're splitting where we see the switch to allow us to record internal or external. In this case, I'm going to record input one and input one, not two. Remember, I'm going to use, I'm going to double input one to both. So my left channel, input one, instead of using the internal mic, and my right channel could be input one or input two or the internal mic. I'm going to choose input one because I'm going to set the volume differently like we talked about just a moment ago to give myself a safety track. But as you see here, we still don't have any volume represented down here at the bottom. So what do we do? Well, we come down here and we realize this is an external microphone that requires phantom power. So we click down to phantom power. And once we get to phantom power, look what happens. We can see it's right here. It's represented. You can see the little bars that are now scrolling up. Now, in this case, I can actually turn one down. Notice now the right channel is lower than the left channel. And I can turn one up high, way high. And that will allow me to peak that channel. It's really turning the sensitivity up. What I like to do is turn one channel to where I'm hitting 12 minus 12 decibels, negative 12 decibels. It's usually the last green bar on the segmented line I'll show you in a second, or in this camera's case, it's the middle thick white bar that delineates an above section and below. In this case, I'm hitting above that, so I would bring that attenuation down, and now I'm hitting right at it. 
On my right channel, I want that to be a safety track, so I'm just going to reduce its volume to where it's three or four individual segments, which represent two decibels each, so that I'm between six and eight decibels lower. In that case, I now have a minus six to minus eight decibel safety track that this would record anytime I press record. Okay, we've gone to two places. In this instance, we've got a microphone that plugged in and we set the gain on the microphone to match the gain that we see on the camcorder that we want. It's very important to note, if you're using a wireless microphone like this one, you will have a second amount of gain to add because this microphone is powered as a separate device that would then plug in. You will have to set your gain starting from your input source. So as on this example of the camcorder, the input source is the actual microphone. If I were using a wireless lavalier or a wireless microphone, the input source would be here, the microphone, which would then plug into the camera's receiver, or the receiver would plug into the camera, that I would then have to set the gain for to the receiver to the camera, and then set the camera to the Yolo box or my streaming source, A10 Mini Pro, whatever you're using, OBS, vMix, XSplit, all that stuff, and then from there to my destination based on whatever uh, destination procedures, best practices they have. Okay, we've gone two steps. Let's go to the third step. We don't see any audio represented in Yellow Box Pro, Mini, InStream, in this case, Ultra. The reason is because we've got an input, which is HDMI 1, which is here, but we have no volume assigned to that input. Well, we come over to the volume. I was already there, but I'm just showing you. We're on the volume pane, which is this one, the audio mixer. And we have all of the different things that we would like to mix with that audio. What we need to do is actually turn audio, HDMI audio on. Now watch this. Did you see what happened? Check that out. Now it may be hard for you to see, so I'm gonna point up here, but now we're getting right up here. I'm gonna go ahead and switch to my display and turn it off. I'm gonna come back to my audio. So I've, I've just turned that graphic off so that there's less to, to worry about. And now I'm going to make this larger so that you can see, there you go. The audio is being represented right here, which you can see up there. And you'll notice there are several different bars, green bars, yellow bars, and red bars. Green bars, you wanna be all the way up in the green until it just goes into the yellow. Green on yellow box is represented by up to minus 12 decibels. Yellow is represented to minus 12 to minus six, which is two, four, six, three or four little yellow bars. And then red over modulating is minus three, two, one, zero and above. That's going to tell you you're going to have horrible audio. In this instance, we now need to check two things to see if we are at audio gain. Unity gain, this is very important. Right now, I already see that my camcorder is set so that my audio is averaging minus 12 decibels. I did it with my eyeballs. I walked you through the process. You saw what we did. There's no other question to have. How do you do it? We adjust the gain settings on the camera. It's that's how you do it. So there aren't any questions to ask about this because we've already set our unity gain. How do we set unity gain here? Well, going back to our audio panel, we actually have unity gain right there. Notice how I can use my audio slider and now I have no sound coming through Yolo box and I can turn it all the way up and it's telling me, oh, it's too excessive. It just gave you me a warning. It says, this is too high. <laughs> well, guess what it is? Look, we're going all the way into the oranges and clipping into the reds. Instead, we wanna take this back until our average peak is just where? If you said the green peeking into the yellow every once in a while, you're right. And that's right there. In this instance, at this distance, this microphone is set to unity gain. Earlier, we talked about having two tracks, right? Two tracks of audio will protect you in post-production. Right now, even with this one input with two different tracks, because one track is louder, it's turned up more than another, if the talent were to move away, you would have a track that has more audio gain on it, more sensitivity on it, so it would pick up a relatively decent sound at a farther distance. 
But let's remember some very important thing about audio before we talk about the content delivery network and what they do. A microphone is only as good as its placement. If you can't get the microphone close to your talent, it will sound terrible. A $150,000 ribbon microphone across the street will sound horrible trying to pick up dialogue. A shotgun microphone like this does not telescope like your telephoto lens. It doesn't allow you to stand further back and then amplify the sound. All a shotgun microphone does is help cancel off access, access off direction sound waves so that it cancels them out so that the audio that's coming straight into the tube, straight on, not from the sides, the audio that's coming straight into the shotgun element has a better chance of being picked up without noise it will still be a low sound, a low amplitude signal, if the audio is very quiet or far away. It will still pick up room tone and noise if it's very far away and the sensitivity is set high. Getting good audio is all about microphone placement first, audio levels second, and then in this instance, our content delivery network third. Once this is up and running, and you're live streaming, your content delivery network is going to take your sound, your signal, and it's going to do something to it. In this instance, because we've set our gain appropriately, YouTube probably won't normalize the audio very much, which means it won't add a whole bunch of noise cancellation, right, a noise reduction software, and it won't boost the signal a lot. And how do we know this? Well, we know this because we can read about YouTube's audio requirements on their best practices, but there's an easy way we can do it too. During the stream, we can right click if we are mastering live on the YouTube page on the video where it says, hey, uh, you know, your video is playing and you can click stats for nerds. When you click stats for nerds, it'll tell you what the loudness is. If it says 100% minus 3D, minus three decibels, then that means you did a pretty good job setting your levels that you were already slightly overmodulated. It was a little loud for YouTube, so you're at 100% volume and they dropped the volume by three decibels. That's not normally a problem unless you set your levels wrong and are clipping and have terrible audio. That's a you thing. That is never, ever, 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 I'm gonna say it again, ever, a yellow box, vmix, it's never an A to mini, it's never an OBS, it's never an XSplit problem. That is a you problem. That is a you problem. I hear it all the time in the forums. Yellow box didn't do this, yellow box didn't do that. Nope, that's wrong. Unless yellow box crashes, the hub, whatever hub you are using is simply outputting what you the user put into it. That includes not knowing how to set your streaming and encoding rate properly. It's a topic for another day, my friends. If your audio is set too low, YouTube will show a plus and boost it. When it does that, that's when it may begin adding um, noise reduction and cancellation features, which are no good for what you want, right? And in those instances, you want to boost the audio here. You might ask yourself the question, like, what should I do when my audio doesn't sound the same from shot to shot, location to location? Well, it's simple. You prefer, perform this process every time you go somewhere. And you might then say, why should I have to do that? I shouldn't have to do that. No, it's all part of your director of photography, your live stream producer requirement. If you don't know that that's something that you should do, then your team, probably just you, to be honest with you, isn't working properly. You are not working to the best for your client, which means you need to get good quick either through this video, through learning, researching on your own. Well, they've got a lot of different options that we can have from here. I'm gonna go ahead and pull this back down and I wanna show you one that I almost never use. Audio follows video, AFV. This will get you messed up in a live situation very quickly. Generally, because you won't have your microphones set up properly. If you are in a podcast situation where you have multiple microphones, let's say they're coming into a device like this. This is the Tascam Porta Capture X8. So I can have the uh, Aura Roadcaster Pro, right? You can have that 
all plugged in, and then that would come out to Yellow Box. Notice earlier, we chose to use audio from HDMI 1 because I'm connected with one camera and I can have two sources of audio. This is an excellent way to do it when we're connected this way. But when I've got multiple sources of audio and I only have two sources of input here, I need something else to connect for those additional portions of audio. In that instance, I will use something like this or what we mentioned before. And the Rodecaster Pro will allow me to choose my audio levels and gain and turn different sources on and off during the recording, attenuate them during the recording, and I will be able to switch separately from what the camera angle is. Now, when you do it this way, you need to turn audio follows video off. If you don't, then it will disregard the audio you have set properly from your microphones, and it will use the audio from the HDMI inputs. And at that point, you're going to have a problem because it's going to sound bad because you planned for this audio and you've only got scratch audio here. Are there some workarounds? Could you do it that way? Absolutely. And this is the way that I generally suggest doing it. Your camera or camcorder can support multiple inputs, generally up to two. Some of my camcorders will support four. Some of my cameras will support four with an XLR adapter for inputs. Well, that's great. In that case, if I've only got four inputs like this, and I've got three cameras or four cameras and I've got a podcast or a broadcast I'm doing, I will simply run all of my audio into the camcorder or the camera that supports the four inputs. I've got a Panasonic HCX350 that supports it and my Panasonic S5 also supports it with the XLR adapter that goes on top. Sony's got one, Canon's got one, you can get four channels of audio. That simplifies your life very much because then all of your audio can run into your camera you can manage the gain on your camera like we did here, and then you can turn off all the follows video, AFV, and turn on audio from your HDMI 1. One camcorder that you want to use, generally your main picture. Doing so will mean that as you switch, that great audio continues to come in, and it makes it much simpler because you don't need a separate device to record the audio. You can do it on the camera. The camera will also record four channels for you as well in those instances, and in this case, they are 48K 24-bit channels. They're great sample rates. If I needed something more 32-bit, I could go for it, but 32-bit does not help you in a live setting. We've talked a lot about audio today, and I hope that you have found it as helpful as I have intended it to be. If you went through this and it made sense to you, you are on the right track. If you need any help with this because you're looking at it and you're all thumbs and hot dogs, then you need to go ahead and step back. Here is a pro tip. Stop complaining. I'm going to tell you this. Take a good look inside. When you encounter a problem, complaints will only worsen the problem. I don't complain in my life. I simply fix the issues that happen. Personal, commercial, productive, whatever. When I encounter an issue, I immediately go into how do I overcome this issue? I am not the type of person that you'll see get mad and start screaming. You know, people will not, they don't describe me as hot tempered because you cannot think when you're hot tempered. I am prone just like you guys to having my feelings hurt and my ego get in the way from time to time. And those times I have to recognize that and step back quickly. Here's the deal, 90 for, I'd say 90%, maybe more maybe even higher is 99% depending on your level of understanding of the problems that you will encounter when you're live streaming is you. The gear can only do what it's told. And as it comes to audio, setting the gain is the first place to avoid content delivery network issues, on camera issues, and microphone placement issues so that you get bad audio. I hope that you found this helpful. Guys, if you want to check up with me and schedule a coaching session or something like that, email me. Check out my website, Rob at Robert Hand Photography. I have been a photographer, wedding photographer, for over 15 years. 10 years ago, I started doing commercial work as well as my wedding photography videography. And six years ago, I started live streaming. I have never looked back and I have made a great amount of money between, uh, of course, weddings, podcasts, um, small commercials for like Hulu and Roku, 
as well as uh, realtors and stuff like that, anything and everything that you can think of, that's where my business has developed to. Although it started with weddings, it developed into something so much more. If you've got a camera in your hand and a live streaming device on your computer desk or something, then you're more than just a one trick pony. You have the capability to do a wide variety of things. And if I can help you with any of those, I will. I'm Rob with Robert Hand Photography. I want to thank you for watching. I'll catch you guys on the flip side. Bye for now.